there are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can light up your funnels. Let's go. This is Performance Marketing Insiders. I'm Chris Mechanic. Join me as we go deep into the secrets of the world's elite marketing minds. Performance Marketing Insiders is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Performance Marketing Insiders. I'm your man, Chris Mechanic, and I'm really, really excited about today's guest. Today's guest has been a marketer, a performance marketer for, for two decades. And he's got a resume unlike any other. He's led teams at Salesforce, Google, Tableau, Deloitte. Uh, he's a, a global marketing leader, really, by any definitions. And currently, he's chief marketing officer at Zoom Info, you know, a little company you probably heard of. But um, he's also a really cool guy. And we've got some awesome content in store for you. So I'm excited to dig in. Welcome, everybody, to the show, Mr. Brian Law. How are yeah. you, man? Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, re- really excited to be here and uh, and talk with you a little bit. Likewise, man. Likewise. And I'll tell you, you know how they say, hey, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I have gone, I've spent some time uh, recently going deep into the chat GPT wormhole, like yeah. I mean, deep. I was a little slow to start, but like that's all I like. I, I spent probably in the last week or two, like 40 hours just reading everything and watching every YouTube video I could find. And it's all I can think about. Like, I'll be talking to clients and they'll be talking to me about this or that. And I'm like, oh, ChatGPT, oh, ChatGPT. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, like, it really, really exciting the potential. I, I think some of the, the promise is, is not yet fully aligned with the reality at the moment, but uh, yeah. the, the promise is really. Uh, really exciting. We, we definitely use it internally. We're trying to bake it into our product. Oh yeah, as as, as is everyone. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, it, it, it's just wildly powerful. The the things that we're going to be able to do with it. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm excited to get into that uh, as well as many other topics. But you know how our audience rolls. We're all about the secrets. I'm super duper curious. Like, what do you consider to be one of your biggest secrets to marketing success? Yeah. So I'd say the the big thing for me is differentiation actually doesn't matter when you're thinking about marketing. It's being distinctive. Uh, and, and I can imagine a lot of you are thinking that makes absolutely no sense. Um, but but there's actually a lot of research that supports it. So first, what is the difference between the two? So differentiated is being different. How do I show that you know my company, my products, my services actually are different than what the competitor is offering? Yeah. Uh, and uh, being distinctive is really standing out and being noticed. Uh, and, and the reason why uh, that's an important distinction is we're all busy. We're, we're, we're bombarded with advertising messages. You know, you know as a, a B2B buyer, there are lots of different technologies and services out there. I don't have time to really understand what's the difference between the product that I'm using or a competitor or two different ones out there. Yeah. Uh, likely, I'm only going to choose one uh, to begin with. So they, we found that, uh, and actually Bain found, they did some research with um, Google that uh, you know, over 90% of buyers have a day one list. And actually 60% of the time, that day one list is only one company. And so you just need to get on that list, which means you need to stand out. And actually yeah. saying what you stand out for actually muddies the, the message. It confuses people. And uh, really just what you need to do is to know that in this case, hey, Zoom Info, we're relevant in this space. This is what we can do. And hopefully you rem- you remember us in a buying situation. And so that is the most important thing. The Ehrenberg Bass Institute, which is the largest marketing research institute in the world, that wrote the book How Brands Grow, uh, has found this time and time again across industries to be the case. Uh, and, and it's a really powerful unlock if you focus more time on how do you stand out, how do you be noticed, and less time on why you versus someone else. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And the part that resonated me- with me the most is that like buyers don't, well, buyers don't necessarily care, a, um, and they just, even if they did care, they don't have the time or like the familiarity necessarily to really un- understand and grasp the difference. And it makes me think of some of my clients, like we have clients that are say like in a certain category, right? Like they'll be in like revenue intelligence, but they want to be thought of as something else because they feel like that's their differentiation. So they're, they really don't want to be compared to any of the other players. They're like, no, we're different, but it's like, you're pretty darn similar in yeah. in most so 
And, so, and, and so we're like related to that. So uh, some of that same research found that brands are essentially branded versions of the category. And so when, whatever that category is, revenue intelligence or BI or whatever it might be, uh, if you actually understand how people think about the category and ask them how they think about different brands, it's actually really, really similar. And there's a ton of overlap. And I've now done this research at two companies that I've uh, been in marketing for, and it's, and it's held out to be true because uh, we just don't spend that much time thinking about products that we're not using. And so you just you just have less understanding and awareness of who they are, but you generally think uh, that, they're, that they're sort of similar. And if you ask someone who's using sort of our product versus someone else who's using another product, they normally have relatively similar understandings of what what what, what you get. So uh, again, it just hammers home. You need to be distinctive. That's what you need to focus on. How are you going to be memorable? And much less on what are those unique uh, sort of value propositions that you're going to offer that someone uh, else won't. It's just not going to so, resonate and land. So, and it, it makes me think of. Um, so, would hu- would humor be an example? So, like we're a digital agency, right? Yeah, yeah. We do the same services that other digital agencies use. And I personally have been racking my brain, like, what's our differentiator? Like, what could we do better than anyone else in the world? What can nobody else possibly say that we can say? So I'm really excited and enthusiastic to hear this, but like, let's talk about an example, either as a digital agency or like, you can just respond to my question of like, would humor do the trick? Like if I'm a life insurance provider and there's a lot of others, but my ads are funny, like those are more noticeable, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, there are a lot of different ways, um, that you can, you can approach it. And there's, there's actually another book that's called, um, Building Distinctive Brand Assets, a uh, very marketing <laughs> jargony book, uh, but but it's uh, it's it's really about a, a sort of one thinking about what you want to be known for and then doing it consistently. And mm-hmm. so it could be we're humorous, uh, it could be we're um, you know always doom and gloom, but we're consistently doing that, or we're we're always the hero. We're the ones who are going to help you overcome the world or tackle whatever obstacle that you're you're, you're uh, want, wanting to to overcome. But, but it's just that consistency. And so it could be um, things like, you know, what are the colors, the logos, the taglines, the symbols, the sounds, the, the characters that, that you want to uh, use. Uh, on the character one, it's actually kind of fascinating uh, thinking of um, just sort of the, the Super Bowl that's now a little bit in the past. Uh, but uh, you can have characters can be celebrities. They can be spokespeople. They can actually be characters like Geico. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of those advertisers spent time on the celebrities. Um, and those are actually the least effective of those if you look at research, mm-hmm. uh, because if you're wanting to be distinctive, if I have George Clooney as my spokesperson, George Clooney's famous and he's known for being an amazing actor and a very good looking gentleman and being in uh, sort of a sponsor for a lot of different things. So he actually helps me be less distinctive than if I were to create like the Geico Gecko, who is only used for Geico. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I think there are lots of different ways to to get at it. Um, in, in terms of uh, sort of the ones that tend to work the best, so uh, characters or faces uh, up there, uh, sounds uh, actually work really well because our, our, our brain, uh, if you think of your brain as different components, we look at colors, shapes, uh, words, sounds all differently, and you want to bring those together. Yeah. Sounds are incredibly helpful. Uh, colors are good for being noticed, but actually aren't very good for memory. Uh, and so that's one that it, that isn't as valuable, but it can help you immediately get, get attention. So yeah, there are a lot of different things you can do humor being one of them. Uh, and, uh, ideally you want to figure out what's going to help create that memory, that emotional connection, because those are stronger from a memory point of view. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really about, you need to figure out what you want to own and then just be super consistent in how you, how you leverage it. Yeah. I want to, I want to unpack the concept of memory. Uh, and you'd mentioned like figure out what your customers care about in this category and how to tie it to memory. I want to unpack that. Uh, but before we do, I would love it if you mentioned, so Brian and I pre-show we were, he had like a few different secrets, which were all good. And we've narrowed it down to the differentiation doesn't matter, but I want to talk a little bit about one of the other ones that you nominated, which was essentially like the same message for all, all segments. Yeah, because I know a lot of our clients and a lot of other advertisers are like, "Hey, you know, we're targeting these three industries, and we need this set of ads for industry A and that set of for industry B," which creates obviously a lot of work. And like, is it actually working better? You know, it's arguable. Can you talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, sure. And, and they're they're in some ways related. So if you think about how um, 
our, our memories work. Essentially, we have lots of nodes in our brain and uh, they get fired uh, in sort of certain situations. So something triggers that memory. And ideally, what you want to do is figure out what in your own brain triggers the, the, the memories so that you can be like, oh, I'm thinking about buying a taco. What are the things I'm going to think about? Mm -hmm. That same concept actually applies across people as well. And so uh, Wharton's Neuroscience Initiative did this sort of at a, at a macro level across people. And they found the more that you use consistency in your messaging across people, the stronger your brand becomes. And so mm -hmm. this idea of being super personalized actually degrades the strength of your brand. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, people might be context uh, shifting depending on how you targeted them. They might move between different companies. Uh, they might move between different roles. And so you actually want to have thoughtful targeting. You want to say, hey, we know we're better in this industry in the B2B space, or we know that we are uh, more successful in sort of this type of buyer. But you want your messaging to actually be really consistent across those different groups. So all of the things that you've heard about be super personalized, have different messaging for person A versus pe person B. Uh, you know, potentially rings true. Uh, a lot of research shows that it actually doesn't land in terms of building sort of your broad brand strength, whether you're in the B2B or B2C space. Yeah. So let's take an example real quick. And if you would indulge me, if we could use the digital agency space, just because like, yeah, that's sure. what I can understand. Um, so when I think about our buyers, they may or may not have any specific memories associated with digital agencies. But one thing that I hear a lot is that they have PTSD. We hired this agency. They promised us the world. They immediately start, you know, started, started screwing up and this and that. So is that an example of what, so now I'm sure there's many buyers that, right. When you say the word, Oh, you should hire an agency. They're like, Oh, we tried that. We've tried it three. Sometimes they tried it three times. It never worked. Right. Yeah. Is that an example of what you mean, or yeah, yeah? So the way, um, the, the sort of the, the the way that the 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 research has uh, been found to hold true is you want to know like who are the people that you're going after, how do they think about buying situations? So the buying situation could be, hey, I'm being told from my CEO I really need to drive uh, greater efficacy in my media spend or what whatever that might be, and then in those situations, what are the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions that that go on in their heads uh, and, and PTSD might be one of them. Hopefully there's some, obviously some positive ones as well. And, and you really want to know what those are. Those are called category entry points. And then you want to attach your brand to the category entry points that will be associated with them purchasing. So maybe not the PTSD one, but, but hopefully the ones that, okay, I, now I'm in the uh, sort of the frame of mind where I'm thinking about an agency and Oh, what, what, what is it? I, I think about, you know, I need to drive efficiency. Uh, I'm wanting to reach uh, buyers in sort of new and differentiated ways. I need help with creative, whatever that sort of collection of things are. And then you want your brand to, to then simultaneously pop up into their mind. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of the way that you want to think about it. And then uh, from a sort of a network effect, if my five you know colleagues or friends have those same sets of connections, then when we're talking about it, we can all think, ah, agency A or agency B. And, and that actually builds the broader brand network effect. Nice. Okay. So when I first heard that, I loved it because the listeners here know that I'm an 80, 20 type of marketer. And, you know, like we train all the teams on 80, 20, it's like, find out the 20% of things that matter the most and do them really, really well and forget about a lot of the other stuff. So I, anything that it has the promise of better performance and is less work, like that's, that's, I love that, which is why I wanted to bring that up for the audience. But um, let's bring this down to earth a little bit. And, sure. you know, just imagine there's a listener who they're like, dang it, like differentiate, like what? Like you're blowing my mind here. So they're like, we've been trying to differentiate. We've been trying to personalize. Like we've, you know, like how do I take a step? But but say that they're they're into this new methodology. How do I take a step? into that direction? Like what would be the first couple things that you would do or suggest doing? Yeah. So a, a, a few, a few things that, 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 that I've now done also at a couple of companies or actually a few companies. Um, so, so first you want to uh, know for your buyer, like what are the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions that they have? Yep. And so the easiest way to do that uh, is to do a survey. So, uh, you know, can, can do it with customers, prospects, uh, people that are just out in your broader market. Uh, and you essentially want to ask them a version of the question of when you are thinking about this category, what are the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that come to mind? And ideally you want them to name multiple. So if you know, they're first going to answer one, say, Hey, 
double down. I, I want a few more to come together because it's that, that interconnection between the different pieces that's really helpful. Mm. Then you want to ask them that same question about your brand and about your competitor's brand. And, and that actually allows you to see what's the, the white space out there in terms of people are thinking about the category and they're not actually thinking about you or the others. And that's where you should actually focus. So in terms of a high level, like what are the things that you want to be known for? That's yeah. a really, really good way to do it. Uh, similarly for what I would call brand assets, those things that are going to stand out. Uh, what you want to do is, uh, and, and it's going to vary company by company, but maybe it's your logo. Maybe it's the color you use. Maybe you do use some for a character. Uh, and you want to show those to them and say, hey, does this make you think of a brand? Uh, and hopefully your, na your name comes up. But you also want to see, is it your name and other ones? Or do you really own that particular asset? Because what yeah. you want to do is have the sort of the recall. They associate your brand with it. But also you are sort of like uniquely recalled. Uh, and when you have those two things together, that's where you want to actually invest more time and effort. Uh, if potentially you're being sort of associated, but not that often, but mm. no one else is, that's an area where you say, okay, I want to make a strategic investment and put more time and effort here. Yeah. If you have an area where a lot of different, like maybe the color blue, uh, a lot of different companies are associated with blue, you probably don't want to be spending time, money, and effort there because you may get some goodness, but also others are as well. Uh, and mm. so I think really figuring out like, what are those thoughts, feelings, emotions? You can do that through getting sort of external input. What are yeah. those assets you think you are strong for? And then sort of get um, external perspective. And, and a really good way to um, to think about sort of those assets is which ones are you using today, but also which ones have you used in the past? Because our memories last, they decay over time. But but if you are associated with something you used five years ago, it may still be something that, you know, there is that connection that you can try and try and invest more in. So, so those would be some ways that I would think about it. Uh, we've done that uh, and it's been really helpful in terms of helping us focus where we want to, um, you know, drive our, drive our messaging, drive our, our branding efforts. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Cool. Well, I'm thinking uh, we ought to probably go do that ourselves and just, you know, get a little cohort together and ask them about their feelings on the category uh, and their, their feelings, memories, associations with the different brand visuals. It's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. It's, it, it, and I think it's kind of fun. It, it puts a little, a little bit of science into the, the creative world, but, uh, hopefully at least the way that I think about it is it creates some boundaries in which you can allow for creative, creative freedom. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a good marrying of marrying of both. Cool. So let's talk about zoom info. Yeah. Uh, I, in prepping for this, I went and uh, and read the Q422 report, and it sounded like a pretty good quarter overall. Um, the uh, the guidance was a little downbeat, but maybe that's kind of on purpose. But a couple things that stood out uh, after I after I had ChatGPT summarize it for me was uh, was that's what it can do, right? The enterprise focus I know is big for you guys, and it sounds yeah. like you've got a really exciting. Uh, new products coming out too with the marketing OS. Tell us about what uh, some of your current priorities are. What are you guys focusing on? What's happening in your world? Yeah. So um, I, I mean, one of the biggest things for us, so uh, most people, including myself, before I joined ZoomInfo, uh, think about ZoomInfo as a, a data company, particularly sort of a contact data company for sales. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and that's definitely who we were a number of years ago. Uh, but but there is a ton of change that we have gone through that we have not done a really good job of letting the market know about. Uh, yeah. So part of the reason that, that I was hired was to, to help fix that. Uh, but yeah, so we, we've gone from having the best uh, B2B data and intent data that's out there. And so we're ranked number one in sort of that space. Uh, and we've really focused on taking all that data and unlocking insights. So really, these are the companies, these are the people that you should be going after. These are the types of things that are going to be relevant because of uh, both sort of scaled uh, uh, signals we take in, but also very focused things in terms of, oh, this company's going through an IPO or got a funding round or they're doing an RFP or here's a leadership change. Um, so sort of real, really driving insights is the first piece. The second one for us is how do you uh, engage customers? So uh, you mentioned marketing to us. That's something that we launched in in March. We now have over 500 customers in it in sort of less than a year. So that's pretty exciting wow. growth. Um, but really across sales and marketing, how do you do uh, connected and integrated outreach? So uh, whether that's through leveraging our, our own DSP for display ads or for social ads or through our email uh, product that we offer, but really across the board. And then the third thing we've really focused on is how to drive um, automation of all of your, your what we would call go-to-market plays. And mm -hmm. so uh, a, a really big focus for me is 
how to get that message out there that we're doing all of these things in support of sales like we have in the past, but also in support of marketing, in support of operations, uh, and then really in this integrated platform that allows you to automate and drive effectiveness. So that, that's mm-hmm. probably the biggest thing that's top of mind for me. And it does align into going into the enterprise, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. And that's, I think, in the context of the of the secrets that you shared, it's a pretty unique challenge because it's kind of a new space. Like, I, I think there's a lot of people that are a lot of buyers in the market that are a little bit confused. They're like, okay, well, you know, like these capabilities exist here, but they all, some of them exist in Marketo. And like, I've got this other part of my stack that's over there. So I could, I could see that being quite a difficult task. Yeah. And in in fact, a lot of the analysts that we've uh, spoken with have highlighted just the general confusion in the market because kind of everyone is saying they're doing everything and you're not really sure what's an ABM platform versus marketing automation platform versus something on the sales side. Uh, And so I I think it's a, a reflection of, uh, a lot of change that's probably going to be happening in our category. I think sales and marketing need to start working together more. And I think the tech uh, that's going to support those is going to have uh, more of a convergence. Uh, it, it's just an overly complicated space. And, and, and I think it's going to lead to more integration and consolidation, uh, which is which is really good for us as customers uh, because yeah. right, there's too much tech. It's too hard to implement. Uh, one of the things there was research that um, Harvard uh, did uh, last year, and they found that uh, on average, uh, so someone in go to market is going between, I think it was 1,200 different apps or web pages uh, a day. Yeah. That's just a waste of time. Um, and so I, I, I think there needs to be convergence, and, and we're trying to help on, on creating that single, single platform to support all of sales and marketing. Do you know an idea that came uh, to me for you guys as you were saying that? Remember the the first step in the actionable about like how do prospects feel about this category mm-hmm. you could theoretically bake that uh data into your product right because you have yeah. all these buyers here and you know you could i don't know the logistics of how you would do it but if you could identify say in the world of agencies like the vp marketers director marketers and basically be like hey we'll give you 50 bucks like answer 10 survey questions like how do you feel about this space how do you feel about that space how do you feel about this so so actually uh, um, something that we're going to be rolling out soon is uh looking at all of the deals that you close and then in the three months prior to your deal closing what are all of the topics that that company is searching in in the broader internet to help provide some insight into so these are the things you want to be going after. These are the messages that seem to resonate. Um, and it's a it, it, combination of that. And then sort of uh, for those of us who are, who are using Chorus, which is our conversational intelligence tool, the things that are being talked about in those conversations. So um, 100% agree. It's something that we're trying to move towards. But I think you added an interesting um, twist to it that's worth, uh, worth thinking about. Yeah, well, that's what I do. Yeah. I accept tips. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, See what I can work out. So tell me some win stories. Uh, I think I'm sure that there's a lot of them, but I'm curious to hear about like a specific campaign or two that you guys ideated and then ran and then it worked really, really well. And you had a champagne toast or a little. Maybe a a couple of things. So um, when the downturn first uh, sort of was noticeable uh, in the second half of last year, um, we weren't sure where people like were in terms of how they were thinking about the downturn. Uh, and so what we did is, because again, all of our sort of external conversations are recorded uh, through Chorus, is we went and said, okay, when people are mentioning downturn, like what are the things that are coming up in those conversations? Uh, and, and we collected that all together and we essentially put it into all of our ads. Uh, and, and we noticed a, a really healthy uptick in terms of uh, whether it was sort of click-through rate or uh, people who were exposed to the ads and sort of coming to our site and whatnot. Uh, and, and it was... Uh, in some ways, a relatively simple thing to do, but it was pretty effective. Um, and so that was, that was kind of a fun way of seeing like what technology do we have at our disposal that, that we can use and, and have an impact on. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And, and then a, a, another one, and again, sort of um, in part leveraging our, our platform is this, I mentioned sort of the Bain research that shows, you know, I get that, you know, 90% of people that have a day one list. And the thing I didn't mention is 90% of the time, I think it's 89% of the time, they choose from that day one list. So being super... Um, timely in all the messaging you're putting out is really, really important. Mm. Uh, and so one of the sort of the plays or the automations that we created is, um, you know, when someone is in your funnel, uh, an opportunity has been opened. And for us, we're focused, as you mentioned, on sort of going up market, mid-market and enterprise uh, above a certain size. 
is we've created these motions that are uh, automated that essentially says, find everyone who's in my ICP, the ideal customer profile. So for us, that's sales leaders, that's marketing leaders, operation leaders, uh, automatically pull that out of our database from ZoomInfo uh, and then trigger off uh, sort of an immediate send. So through social, through display, through direct mail, through sort of a Marketo email, because uh, we, we leverage Marketo on sort of the marketing side or through sort of the, the, the sales engagement. Uh, and then uh, we did it across uh, all of those different channels in a sort of a multivariate test to see what combinations worked, what messages worked. Uh, okay. And that was another area where we actually saw uh, sort of faster closes, bigger deals uh, coming through. Um, oh, that's sexy. And, uh, and, and, and we actually saw like what were the combinations for new versus existing customers that worked the best so we didn't have to waste money in areas that didn't work as much. That's um, awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, and it yeah, again, it's, it's it's even more fun when it, when it works. So that was... Uh, uh, that, so it's basically at a certain pipeline stage, like once they either enter or reach a certain step, you then have these automatic campaigns that, that trigger, trigger yeah. to, to essentially like lubricate that sales process and get them through. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And so, we, and, and so that like one we've, uh, we've now essentially on our, our website, so you can go to like zoominfo.com slash plays, uh, yeah. we've put up a bunch of free plays that we know that work that we used and that our big customers have used. Oh, no uh, and so they're there for anyone who wants to take a look. Uh, and then we've that. actually taken those and put them directly in our platform. So that if you want to try it, you can just say, try it. And it pulls you into the platform and it's already set up. You just need to choose like who you're going after and whatnot. Um, That's awesome. So it's it's kind of fun when the stuff we're doing uh, makes it out into the product that the broader the broader world can use. Uh, zoominfo.com slash play looks like it. Zoominfo.com slash play or plays. Plays with an S. Yeah, oh, plays. I was like, it's down. No. We uh, we mentioned it on the pod and it just got an overwhelming amount overwhelmed. of traffic and knocked yeah, the, so knocked the folks, server but, uh, down. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh and, and again that's I mean that for anyone you don't have to be using our platform to to use it. It's just free ideas that are out there and you know what what's the trigger you should think about. Uh, what are the steps that you that's should, an should awesome follow. resource. Yeah, that's it's it's pretty that's cool. That's such a cool resource. Yeah, we'll include a link in the in the description. But zoominfocom slash plays and there's a lot of them on there. Yeah. Lookalike ICP targeting, abandoned chat follow-ups. That's smart. Yeah. That's really smart. Almost nobody's doing that. Fast SLA on form fills. Sick. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're truly the ones that work best for, for us. And uh, we, we spend a lot of time helping uh, customers build out their own plays. So it's you know, wow. the ones that also we know work for, for customers too. So you guys are really eating your own dog food. Yeah. It, and it's, uh, I mean, I've certainly uh, worked at companies that have amazing products, but not ones that I could take advantage of as a marketer. So it's fun actually having products that, that we can use. So it's uh, that's awesome. Yeah. In the so what are your right. challenges? What are you struggling with? What do you need more of? Um, yeah. So the, I mean, I'd say the, the biggest thing is awareness outside of, of sales. So that the number of CMOs that I talk to uh, that say, ah, oh, yeah, Zoom Info, you guys do some stuff for sales, but no yeah. idea what you guys do for marketing. Uh, and uh, it's it's a real problem because we have an amazing ABM platform that just the world is not yet fully fully aware of. So yeah. that, that's probably the biggest one for, for me is how to better um, tell our story, get out in front of people, be consistently distinctive uh, yeah. so that we can break through the noise. There's some competitors that have been around for a long time in the space. And so we're, we're sort of the new um, the new game in town. Uh, so, so that, I'd say that is the the number one focus for us. And then the second one is, uh, I mean, we've traditionally been really strong in sort of the upmarket uh, space, but we just, as we've done additional analysis, and I'm big into analytics, uh, you know, not surprisingly, uh, larger companies have more potential to grow, uh, but we've just seen them to be stickier in general, and particularly in the downturn. Yeah. Uh, and so, really making sure that we are doing enough on the the sort of the front of the funnel with new customers, bringing them in. So that it gives our sales team the ability to to grow over time uh, is uh, definitely an opportunity for us. I think we're we're doing a good job, but we're not yet doing a great job uh, in, yeah. in that space. So those are sort of the biggest the biggest focus areas for for me. that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of things come to mind from like the enterprise side of things, just getting more enterprise uh, ops and deals in the door. But the first one is quite challenging. Like, how do you educate a market that you're not just because you guys have been known as like the data people for many years so like when yeah. that's just ingrained like i bet a lot of sales people in cm or a lot of cmos might just say they might not just say oh yeah that's a sales thing they might be like oh that's like sales data right yeah, yeah. so like dissociating the, that memory to use yeah, 
It, even one of the funny things for us is, uh, I mean, we have this sort of sales or product for sales. Uh, it actually has a lot of stuff that that's embedded that marketing can use. And I'm just surprised by how many marketers I talk to because we have um, almost 35,000 customers uh, that don't realize that they could be leveraging something for free. Uh, and I'm yeah. like, hey, you can be tracking all of your website visitors for free. It's already available. Just yeah. add a script to your website. Uh, or you have all these intent topics you could already be leveraging, like it's included in your offer. Yeah. And the tech, uh, and it, the t- yeah. I know you guys have the technographics built in too. So like you yeah. can build your email list with that. Yeah. it's And so that's always the thing like, as a buyer of a lot of marketing technology, it always pains me when I realize there's all these things that I'm not taking advantage of. I'm just throwing money away. Uh, yeah. And as a, uh, yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, like I think my job, our job is to make sure that our customers are, are, are growing. Uh, and so uh, it, it's fun when I can see us helping them. It pains me when they don't realize that they could be taking advantage of things for free. So uh, I, I think that sort of ties into the awareness opportunity. But um, yeah, really making sure that our, our customers are getting the, the full value out of what they're, what they're spending with us. As I'm thinking about it, like you guys have so much data. Like it's just, it's mind boggling. I mean, I've, I've known that, but talking about it, like I didn't, really well i wasn't thinking about chorus but like chorus massive just volumes because yeah. you have the transcript data right yeah, yeah. And, and machine learning that volumes, helps pull out the, yeah. reams of data and and a wide variety of it like you know you could search about people's feelings or sentiment around these topics or the popularity around those topics or by industry that Geez, yeah. Louise, it boggles the mind. And that's just one product. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, so th- there, there is, yeah, it's an embarrassment of riches in, uh, in some ways, but yeah, I mean, all the things you can do with course recording. So, uh, I mean, basic stuff is, Hey, w- when your competitor is being mentioned, you should focus on those and figure out what, what's going on there or a particular topic is being mentioned. But uh, I think some of the things that are really fascinating is you, when you look at it at scale across your sales team is you can see, uh, you know, how much time is is your sales team actually doing discovery and listening to sort of objections and addressing objections and which ones tend to be more successful in addressing object, uh, those objections. And so yeah. there's just a lot of insights that you can take as a marketer and say, ah, well, let's get this up in front of people because we need this before they, because sometimes people aren't going to actually express the concern that they have, but yeah. know, we can hear it. Uh, and the, the machine learning tells us that. And then we can say, yeah, let's make sure it gets into our marketing materials. Um, totally. But then- yeah, go ahead. You could even ask the salespeople to use certain language at certain times, you know, like it as a trigger word so that you can, you know, f- like we did it accidentally one time because we have, um, we started a new thing called a playbook, which is kind of like an audit and a strategy mix. And we, you know, told the salespeople about it and they yeah. go out and sell it. And then so we would search playbook and we could hear every time they were mentioning it, how they're describing the product, how people are responding to it and so on. So yeah. there's layers it's, to it, man. There's it, layers. It, it's fun. And we're just have been rolling out a new messaging framework uh, that we're going to be using in all of our advertising. And uh, we're about to do sort of our sales kickoff where, you know, this is what it is. You need to use it. And then we can go through all the course calls and we can say, you know, who's actually leveraging it and who's not in a scaled way so that yeah. we can sort of enforce because, again, that consistent distinctiveness is super, super, super important. So, yeah, that the... Uh, I, I think many times conversational intelligence is seen as really like a sales tool, which it certainly is, but it's a huge opportunity and like a wealth of data for, for marketing as well. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an, it's a nice, a nice tool, tool to be able to have. Yeah. The word budget might be a good one, but I'm also thinking like we sometimes in an attempt to train the AI built into Google ads or built into Facebook ads we like to fire signals right so not every lead is created equal so for instance yeah, yeah. like we might not fire a conversion when every or on every single form submission but we might say only fire it like if they've also viewed at least three other pages and spent three minutes on the site yeah, yeah. so that way it's like the best buyer or the most engaged buyers that are sending the signal back and helps the ml find more of that you get it but i was thinking about that same concept with like characteristics of the first call so like showed up to the call would be a good signal to fire right yeah you want people showing up or like spoke a lot during the call or said these words during the call it'd be pretty sweet if you could like fire a conversion event based on the based on call call transcript 
yeah. into the platform. What in in one one of the things that I've um sort of a, a balance and you mentioned I spent uh, part of my career at Google. Um the it's always a question of for me, and I'll just talk about Google, what applies to Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, others. What are the sort of the attributes that their models can interpret? Uh and, yeah. and I found uh again, I'll just use Google as an example. Um Sometimes they're very, very good at interpreting certain types of signals, and other times it just comes across as noise. And uh, yeah, many, many times I feel like we have more data to potentially provide. It doesn't always translate into uh, sort of intelligent uh, sort of reactions when you influence sort of the bidding uh, algorithms. But yeah, it, it's it's worth trying because uh, yeah. there's there's a lot of potential, a lot of potential power uh, in there. And, and and a big thing we've looked at in addition to things like that is. You know, which are the customers that are not just likely to convert, but the ones that are going to grow over time? And how do we get, you know, the, the platforms to help us get more uh, more of those? But yeah, the, the the power of data, technology, AI, it's 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 really, really cool. And I feel like we are just scratching the surface. Uh, and, and you mentioned chat GPT is uh, sort of a, a, a different application of sort of that, those advanced algorithms. It's, um, yeah, it's fun being a marketer right now. Dude, this is the moment. This is the biggest opportunity that we will ever get in our careers to be like early. Like this, this is like being, you know, one of the first uh, developers in the app store. But the app store is probably going to be, I think, 10 times bigger than like it's, it's insane, dude. Yeah. It's really crazy. Um, So the time is just flying by here. Uh, I want to ask about ChatGPT so badly, um, but I want to learn more about you, just like you as a person. Like, could you basically like take us on a brief chronology of your life? Like, take us back to Brian the kid, and then went to college here, and then like yeah. when did you know you wanted to be a marketer? Like, how that how that all play out? Yeah, um, and I definitely have uh, had a very a varied um, a varied career. So I uh, yeah, coming up into college, I was convinced I wanted to be a politician. Uh, so I went to school in DC, spent a year on Capitol Hill. I quickly realized I I did not want to be a politician, <laughs> uh, but but that idea of helping people at scale was something I was really excited about. So I I, I went into psychology for that that was my um, uh, focus in undergrad, uh, psych and philosophy, uh, and uh, yet yeah, thought about becoming a psychologist, but very quickly shifted into how could I do it in a sort of a measurable, scalable way within organizations, and so went <laughs> into doing some research in that space. Uh, and then uh, first started with employee engagement, leadership development, performance management. Uh, and then after business school, I switched into overall corporate strategy. So a company called um, Monitor Group that was bought by Deloitte. Uh, and that was a lot about helping companies grow. And a big part of helping companies grow is figuring out your marketing strategy and which audiences you want to go after and like what's relevant for them and the, you know, the products and the industries and geos. Um, got to live in a lot of really cool countries doing that work. So Brazil, uh, Mozambique, South Africa, which is originally where I'm from, India, UAE, uh, and then Australia. Uh, and then I, um, yeah, my, my, my uh, wife who I met when I was in Brazil, uh, rightly pointed out that I was traipsing her around the world uh, and we probably should have a little stability. So moved into internal consulting uh, or internal strategy at Google. So I was part of the central strategy team there. And then uh, it was actually only at Rackspace, uh, which was after Google where I moved into marketing. So still mm -hmm. the bulk of my career was actually in strategy and, and sort of analytics. Uh, and it was, uh, yeah, I was came in as chief of staff to the CEO there. And then I moved into marketing at Rackspace. And then that's where my marketing uh, career took off. But it was this, it felt like a perfect home because I just love strategy. I love thinking about customers. And then I love using data and technology to help solve problems. Um, well, that's really so, interesting. So that's how I actually moved into marketing in, uh, it was 20, 2015. So it's still relatively, relatively recent. That's really interesting. A lot of the guests on the show sort of were born marketers, like they knew they wanted to be marketers early on. They admired the Mad Men era type of thing. But your your story is interesting in that you basically started with people. Like you started by understanding psychology of people. Then you started by understanding businesses and the strategy and the and the data associated. And then once you had that, you turned around and applied it to marketing, which is yeah, it's it's been Pretty fun. I think part of the it. reason, like, I really enjoy neuroscience and the role that neuroscience and memory plays in, in marketing, just sort of bringing those pieces uh, pieces together. And, and luckily, at Tableau after Rackspace and the Salesforce had a chance to to put that into practice. And then, yeah, ZoomInfo has been a really great uh, company in terms of letting me test out some of my theories. And so far, they've generally proven to be uh, sort of correct. So I've I've had a little bit of latitude to, to try out more of them. Well, you're killing it, man. You're killing it. 
Uh, I'm really impressed by you as well as uh, Zoom Info. I hope you can come back on the show one time. Now it's time for the lightning round. I'm going to ask you three quick questions. I ask every guest and you just answer uh, kind of in rapid succession. But first up is top three books or influencers or authors that have really made a big impact on your life. Um, so uh, first couple I'll do like work related. So how brands grow the one by Aaron Brick Bass uh, Institute mm-hmm. favorite book. Uh, they have sort of, uh, two additional ones, but, uh, I really, really like that one. Uh, don't make me think it's about a web it's web usability, yeah, but I think it has a broad application. I really, really yeah. like it. Uh, and, and then not work related. Uh, I, I love Nelson Mandela's, uh, long walk to freedom, uh, mm-hmm. just ties into sort of where I'm from, but, uh, it, it always, Thinking about the suffering he went through and and the way that he rose out of it, uh, it puts everything in perspective. And so, no no work challenge is is really that big of a challenge. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, just yeah, how he used empathy to 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 have success and eventually become president of South Africa. I think it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. Are you from South Africa? Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was born oh, there and cool. moved to the U.S. when I was six. So I was pretty pretty young when I I came came out to the states. Interesting. Very cool. All right. Next up. Uh, if you were to start a side hustle, what would that side hustle be? Um, so, uh, I, I think p- potentially the more practical one is that I'd love to be a sort of a university professor. I just love research. Uh, uh, the fun one, I, like I love to travel. I love to travel. So if someone were willing to pay me to go and, uh, sort of stay at resorts and do sort of resort reviews, uh, mm. maybe doing sort of blogging or whatnot, that would be, be a YouTuber. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I might be a little bit hard with two little girls and, and, mm. and a wife, but maybe, uh, maybe I can convince my wife we do traveling school or something like that. So uh, that would cool. be the second one. And then last up is how do you avoid burnout for yourself and your team? Um, yeah. So, uh, Something that uh, th- this was something that, that we did at Salesforce that I brought uh, with Zoom Info, but this idea of, of maker time. So we have sort of a cut, c- we do two, two and a half hour blocks per week mm-hmm. of just focus time to be able to get stuff done. That's good. Um, something I'd also do for my team is there's sort of hours where outside of those hours, you're not allowed to send emails. You have to delay send them until sort of the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because I think good. having having sort of defined times where you know you don't need to be paying attention to stuff is really, really important. Yeah. Uh, and then personally, uh, just figuring out what that way is to get away, uh, whether that's sort of uh, meditating or exercise, but just a sort of a mental break is, uh, is important. Yeah. I've definitely been guilty of an after hours email or two, but I'm working on it. I'm definitely, I definitely am cool, man. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're loving it, please drop, drop us a like or a comment or share this with a friend. Uh, Brian, uh, let the listeners know if they want to learn more about you or zoom info, what the best way to do that is. Um, so I would say certainly if you want to learn about zoom info, come to zoominfo.com. uh, that website, zoominfo.com slash plays, really good place to go. And then feel free to ping me on, on LinkedIn. I, I love making new connections and, uh, and learning from others. That's how, uh, how we all grow. So, uh, yeah, please reach out. Uh, and it's Brian, uh, law, B R Y A N law, L A W, uh, at, uh, at zoom info. Love it. And we're, we'll include a bunch of links to the resources and tools that Brian has mentioned here today. Thank you for listening as always, and we'll see you next time. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at performancemarketinginsiders.com. This podcast is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the performance agency that makes you smarter, offering AI-driven search, paid social, analytics, and conversion rate optimization for financial services, health, B2B, and SaaS brands that know. Hey guys, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, you can get a performance marketing assessment for free. And this isn't some cookie cutter automated report. It lays out detailed, specific things you can do right now to unlock limitless growth and nirvana level personal satisfaction. To claim your free assessment, just go to performancemarketinginsiders.com slash audit and you'll have your customer report within just a few days. 